This week, uh, I'd kind of like to follow up a little bit. Last week we were talking about the resurrection and the glory that we all find within the, the living Jesus. And the problem that a lot of people have is they don't understand what it means to connect with the living Jesus to be saved. And so the title of my message today is The Saved of God. And the text is going to be 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. And I'll have some other uh, verses in the message. But starting out, he writes in verses 2, 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness, godliness, and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth. Now, if it were possible to summarize the entire purpose of God through His Word in just one sentence, it would be a likely choice, something like the statement Jesus made in Luke 19 and 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now if we could capture the whole theme of God's holy word in just one word, that word would have to be salvation. The most difficult word of the entire Bible seems to be this word, save. I mean difficult because it has been abused horribly by the interpretation of men concerning God's commands. It's lost its power, its meaning, by the weakening and influence of men's opinions. We've almost become afraid to use the word saved. We don't want to challenge people. We ask of what faith or affiliation or church membership someone has, but this is not the question God wants us to ask. God wants to know if you are saved. Amen. He doesn't care what church you go to. He wants to know if you are saved. The issue is not if you are a good citizen of your city or county or the federal bureaucracy. A loyal father, a loyal mother, a faithful wife, an obedient child. It's not a matter of good standing or a fine reputation or church attendance alone. Neither it is, a, is it a matter of giving acts of service or uh, good deeds or even a matter of believing some particular creed or participating in certain church ordinances such as baptism. The issue with God is, are you saved? Now immediately somebody's going to ask, well, saved from what? Sin? Well, yes. And are we going to positively respond with, yes, sin? If God made anything plain to us, His children, it is the knowledge of what is sin. You see, sin is what dug the great gulf between man and God. It is sin that built every hospital, every prison, coffin. It dug every grave and broke every heart, including our Lord and Savior's. It is sin that started every war taught us how to hate, and created every bit of jealousy and selfishness. 
It is sin that divided every broken home and split so many churches. You can dress it up, make sin look beautiful and enticing. And Satan is a master of that. But it still kills just as dead. For sin is the transgression of God's laws. But God's Word cries out salvation to all even before the birth of Christ. The angel announced to Mary that thou shalt call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. It's a word play on the name of Jesus and the, the word for salvation. If there is no salvation from sin, then Jesus died for a mistaken cause. Paul's suffering was foolishness, and the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost were all deceived when they submitted themselves to be baptized. If there is no forgiveness from sin, then the church is built upon a fraud, and the message of the church is built upon an untruth. But thanks be to God, we read that there was foolishness in the life of Paul. But it was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. We also find that the church was built for certainty upon the rock, Jesus the Messiah. Now the household of God is built upon that foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Himself being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2.20 says, For another foundation can no man lay other than that which is laid, that is Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 3.11 states, And God is not willing that any should perish, but all would have everlasting life. And as concerning salvation, it's here that we have to answer the question, Who is it, this person, that God is saving? And Jesus Himself gave us the answer. I came to seek and to save the lost. God saves the sinner who is lost. And Jesus tells us a different way in a different place in Mark 2.17. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, God saves the sinner. To be saved of God, we have to recognize our own condition and admit that we are in a state of being called lostness. This state of being that we find ourselves in to be saved is lostness. The Great Commission is to preach the gospel to sinful people. And even today, the only people who need the gospel are sinful people. But if you think you're without sin, then you really need nothing because you're perfect. You don't need the gospel, the church, or Jesus. So this means you're the only living person who has ever lived that can bypass the cross upon which Jesus died. No, you say, you know this can't be true. For the gospel is not for the sinless. For there is no one who is sinless apart from Jesus. And He is the living gospel. We know well the letters of Paul in the letters of Romans. He says, There are none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. 
John's words in the first letter also tell us of a truth. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. We also have something else to consider. God saves only that person who wants to be redeemed. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't stand there with a fire axe chopping the door down and says, I'm going to come in and get you. This type of person includes, excludes three types of people. And we have to understand that. There are three classes of people in regards to divine redemption that this plan does not really apply to. And it's important for us to understand that babes who have not reached the age of accountability don't fall under this. If a baby dies, it, it is not subject to this. I know a lot of people who lose their children at a tender age, they wonder if they go to heaven. Well, yes, they do, because God's commandment is not for them. In their sinless state, they have no need of obedience to the gospel because they haven't transgressed God's law yet. A second group is those who do not possess the mental capabilities necessary for understanding of divine law. Because to God, a man has to make a conscious choice. And for those who have no mental capability to make a conscious choice, they don't fall under that provision of God's law. A third class of people excluded from the gospel consideration is those who are unconcerned about Jesus' life and His eternal salvation. They are the lost. The gospel is only for men and women who cry out to David, to God as did David and said, My sin is ever before me. It is for people who pray, Be merciful to me, a sinner, as did the publican. Only when a person has a desire to have their sin removed, and be made clean through the blood of Jesus, is it only then, or it is only then, that the gospel is ready for that person? Like I say, Jesus' gospel is at the door, knocking. It's not coming in with a fire axe and a big truck and a fire hose to put out your fires. <coughs> Let me say here that Jesus saves the man who will cooperate in his own salvation. We have to have a hand in it. Ephesians 2.8 says plainly that by grace are you saved. It is the gift of God. But it also states that grace is applied through faith or faithfulness. And there is no faith without obedience. There are many, I am certain, who know that they are sinners and have a desire to be saved, but they don't want to cooperate in this matter. They have become excuse makers. They always have some excuse as to why they don't want to come to church. They don't want to accept the message of God. In Luke 14, there's a story of those who made excuses as to why they would not attend the great feast. Well, one guy bought a piece of ground and had to wait and attend to his property. Uh, one had five yokes of oxen to attend to and feed and take care of, and another one had a new wife. And the only one that really had any... Uh, hope of having a, an excuse with the one with a new wife because he probably knew he'd get in trouble if he didn't do what she told him to do. But that being it said, <clears throat> I don't think they were telling the truth about why 
they didn't want to attend the, the feast. They were just evading the question. I'm sure that they would have not minded being saved, but they refused to cooperate by giving themselves over to Jesus. And we have become much too much like this. Instead of desiring to be saved from our sins, we want to be saved within our sins. And that's the message you see all over the world today. People want to be saved, but be able to sin just like they were doing every day. A man may say, for example, my job prevents me from becoming a Christian. Well, now certainly that is true, and you know we have to work to live, but what God will do is more important than waiting until we're six foot under the ground to make that decision. If men were as faithful to God as they are to their jobs and other interests, the world would be one to Christ in our generation. We wouldn't have to go anywhere else. It could be done today if everybody would go out. This means that there is something more important even than our daily bread. We have to eat. We have to live. Well, not really. But we do have to die. The most important thing in the world is our obedience to Christ. Because we could all die today. A meteor could just fall out of the sky and hit us while we're sitting here and it doesn't matter. Obedience to Christ needs to be taught to every person because that is the critical point of salvation. God gives us more homes, churches, Schools and school teachers, colleges, and all of this who will teach our children something other than the doctrines of Christ. We have to do that. The world's busy teaching them all kinds of stuff that really are going to devastate them. There are men who need the gospel but who feel good enough as they are. They may feel very proud of their accomplishments and no, feel no need to come to Christ. There are some who just feel too good to feel lost. They don't understand what it is. They don't understand the eternal significance of being lost. Christ cannot save the self-righteous. He can only save the sinner. Then again, there are some who will just not surrender to Christ because they feel it's going to cost them something. Now, you know, I'm, my background is Scotch-Irish and I'm pretty tight. I don't want to spend money on something if I don't think it's really necessary. And man, there's a lot of people who just don't feel that there's some good return in on this investment here. Well, I'll tell you right now, to be saved will cost you everything. Salvation costs us a lifetime of commitment. And we have to turn everything that we have and are over to God.
if we don't turn over everything to God and turn it over freely, it means nothing to you. What a tragedy that we have been taught to give to God like we pay the milkman or the paper boy or our landlord or whatever. The church, by what we give to the church of our wealth and our strength, We must not govern our giving of ourself and everything about our lives just to meet a basic need. Our spiritual makeup when we are saved is such that we have to give of ourself entirely, whatever that need is. We have to meet our responsibility as a believer and we're taught in God's Word that our sin and our soul cost God all the best that He had. It cost Him His Son. What does our church cost us? What does our salvation cost us? We have to understand that God saves the man who believes in Him. What did the Philippian jailer hear? when the walls came down and he was fearful of his life. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. But is this small thing enough? Then what shall we do with the words of God in Acts 17? God commanded men everywhere to repent. Or again here, the words of Jesus in Luke. Repent or perish. And if this is sufficient, why did Paul write for God to say in Romans 10, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto all nations, or unto salvation. Can't read my own writing. As Philip asked the eunuch, if you believe with all your heart, you may be saved. And the eunuch confessed. And if this completes our submission to God, why is it in every case of those in the Bible are they told to be baptized for the remission of their sin. To wash away their sins. Well, it is evident that no one of these acts alone is sufficient for God. Not just to believe. Not just to accept but we have to do a process. We have to do things obediently in order to be saved. Or else, God becomes the author of confusion and is some respecter of persons. No. There's a process here. We have to realize we're a sinner, confess that we're a sinner, be baptized. Be obedient to God and His Word. Amen. For the Word is filled with Scriptures which state we are saved by grace 
Faith, calling on the name of the Lord, believing, repenting, baptism, by enduring faithfulness. Romans 8.24 states we are saved by hope. We knew it is not being saved by hope. Just that one word. But by rightly dividing the word of truth in a harmonious obedience of all of His word. We have to do all of what He commands us, not pick and choose as so many in the world want to do. Well, I only have to do this to be saved or this to be saved. No, there is things that we all need to do to be saved, and that is to obey the totality of God's Word, not pick and choose. As most people, we want to contend with God. We want to say, well, if you'll just do this, I'll do this. I'll be saved if I can do this. No, we have to do all of what God commands us. To not be sinners. Sin is missing the mark. We've talked about that before. All we have to do if we do miss the mark is try to aim better the next time. And tell God, I missed the mark and I'm sorry. <clears throat> Help me to not do that again. Sin is not a difficult problem to overcome for those who want to overcome it. For those who want to get out of a sinful life. But for those who enjoy sinning, who are self-righteous, who don't feel like they're sinners, God has nothing for them because they don't want what God has. They set themselves up to be God themselves. We as believers should always want what God wants so that we can become in fellowship with Him. That we make the choices like in Deuteronomy. Follow God. Choose this day whom you'll serve. Because the blessings of God will come if we choose God. The true blessings of God. And Jamie was talking about how it, wonderful it was to reconnect with his family. Let me tell you, family is a blessing from God. If we get out from God's blessings, our families can be destroyed. We talked, saw that this morning in the Bible study. He had the diagrams of the family. If the family gets out of whack, bad things can happen. I'm not saying that godly men and women don't have family problems. They happen. But blessings will occur and problems can be solved if we turn to Jesus and allow Him to become Master and Lord of our life and take the sin out of our life. We need to start today by coming just as each one of us are. Not letting the things that are undone stay undone. But we need to make that commitment to Jesus and become the saved of God <clears throat> because those who are saved of God are those who do His will. We need to become God's will doers. Yes, we will do what You have us to do. Yeah. If there's any of you here today who need prayer, who need to make a decision for God, feel free to make that decision for God.
all we have to do is say, yeah, I sinned, I messed up, I don't want to do it again. And God is honorable to forgive that sin. There's nothing that we can do that can keep us from God if we just acknowledge that we made a boo-boo and we want to be back into a relationship with our Father. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. And all who would come to Him will be saved. We will be in a state of salvation. And all that word entails wholeness, peace, Let's just go to the Lord and pray.